Uh, okay, hi, uh, I'm Tamir. I'm going to talk about uh, implementing C++ semantics in Python. Uh, just before we get started, uh, this is the picture that's on the conference website. As you can see, it's not exactly what my hair looks like now. This is pre-COVID, this is post-COVID. Things happen. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> so before we start, a few questions by Rezovan. Uh, who here uses C++ and as a primary language? Okay, and who uses Python and as a primary language? Oh, you have a few people, nice. Okay, just regarding your questions, uh, there's a, a slide number for every slide. Uh, try and pay attention to those. It would be easier to go back and look for the slides you're interested in uh, if you write them down. Okay, so first thing first, why do we actually want to bring features from C++ into Python? After all, C++ is low level, mostly expert oriented, and slowly becomes more Pythonic with new features being added to the standard. On the other hand, Python is high level, beginner friendly, and has a lot less foot guns than C++. So why would we want to bring anything from C++ to Python? The answer is resource management. In C++, um, all resources, whether they're memory or files or anything else, are handled the same way. On, in Python, on the other hand, they're handled differently. Uh, memory is handled by the garbage collector, but everything else, be it files, sockets, DB connections, whatever type you create that needs to be distracted properly, uh, you have to handle that yourself. Now, it's not like you have to call the functions all the time, like in C. Uh, Python does offer you uh, some construct to make it easier. Just a second. to manage resources in Python, we have context managers. Context managers are a pretty simple construct, basically. Uh, to use them, we use the with statement. When we use it, uh, we create a new indented, uh, indented block. When entering the block, we call the enter function uh, in order to do whatever needs to happen when we initialize the object. And then when we leave the block, whether it's by returning, by just getting to the end of the block, or by throwing an exception, we call an end exit handler. If there was an exception, uh, the exception information will be passed to the exit handler. Uh, to define a context manager, all we have to do is create a class that has an enter function and an exit function. Now, it all seems nice, but let's see what happens in real code. Uh, this, is, this has been redacted from actual code they have in production. Uh, basically, we have uh, some information inside the zip file, and we want to read. We have many, many files inside. So we have a class that loads the zip file, opens every single file in the zip file, and puts it into a dictionary. Then when we want, when we want to get the data, we just ask for a, spe uh, for a specific file name and get that file from the zip file that's been expanded into memory. Uh, and here's an example of the usage. We just initialize the reader and ask for some data from the reader. Now. What happens with real code over time is that things change. In my example, in the, in the archives we were using got a lot bigger from something that we could just expand in memory and be fine with that. It got so big that it could no longer be contained in memory. This means that instead of unzipping everything ahead of time and just asking for the part we need, we need to unzip it only when we actually need, it, need the information. Uh, because opening a zip file also takes some time because there is metadata that has to be read, we can't just open the file every time and then unzip. We need to hold the file open in our uh, reader class and then use it when we need it. This makes the code change a bit. In the uh, init function, which is the Python constructor, uh, we create a new uh, zip file object and store it in a member variable. Then, in the read function, we read from the file just like before, but instead of reading into a dict, we just return the information. Then we need to convert our class into a context manager because we need to manage the zip file resource. In the enter function, we just return ourselves, which is very common with context managers. And in the exit function, we close the zip file. And then when we use then when you use the code, it changes a bit because instead of just initializing the object and reading from it, we need to use a with statement. 
And additionally, if we are store that object inside another object, uh, the changes that we just made to the archive reader would propagate up, and we'd have to make that class a context manager as well. That keeps propagating higher and higher and higher in our code. Uh, if we cannot change the code that uses our uh, object, we cannot make those changes. And this is quite an issue. Well, C++ has a solution to all that. Destructors. In C++, all resources are managed using destructors. Uh, they have three main properties that are of interest to us. First, they're automatic, then they're composable, and they're implicit. First, automatic. The invocation of a constructor is automatic. When we have scope, and we get out of the scope, just like with context managers, the destructor is called no matter how we leave that scope. Then composition is seamless. If we have an object in our class and we add into it another member object, the destructor of that member would be called automatically after our destructor is run. We don't need to do anything to make that happen. So composition is a lot easier than in Python. And last but not least, Last but not least, um, destructors are implicit in the interfaces in C++. If we have an object with no destructors or an object with a destructor, they're used exactly the same. Yes, there are some cases where we would make the destructor private and make some change, but generally destructors do not change the way our code looks because they always exist. So our goal in this talk would be to take this code and the big archive reader. It is currently 11 lines. Uh, four of them are resource management, and it uh, pollutes the interfaces above it. And convert it to this. Uh, seven lines, no interface pollution, and no resource management. And we want to ma make sure that the usage remains the same as the original reader. No with statement, nothing else. Just uh, initialize an object and use it. Now. Before we get started with the actual code, a word of warning. We're doing a lot of dirty hacks here. You probably don't want to use it at war. Your uh, managers might not be happy if you do that. Or, you know, whoever does the code reviews. So, uh, with us in this journey, we'll have the greeter class. The greeter is a very simple class. When we initialize it, it says hello, and when we destruct it, it says goodbye. And since we already know context managers, it's going to be a context manager, and we can use it and have print hello and goodbye. It's going to come with us as we improve our implementation. First, automatic. Now, as we've seen, context managers are already automatic. We don't need to do much. Uh, we have one greeter, we create it, we print something in the middle, and everything works, and we can add another one, and another one. But as we keep adding more objects, uh, the indentation keeps growing and growing, and it's gonna get us at some point. Uh, So uh, to deal with that, instead of just stacking indentation, uh, let's use a proper stack. Uh, instead of just creating, using with statement for each and every object to create, we're going to use a destructor stack specifically. Uh, we create a destructor st uh, scope object. It holds a stack. We're using a list because it has pop and append uh, function, so we can use it exactly like a stack. Uh, in the enter, again, we don't need to do anything. When we exit the scope, we're going to go over all the members in the stack and destruct them. And this way, the push function so that we can push our members, our objects into the stack. Then our code will look something like this. We create the stack, then we create the first greeter and push it into the stack, create the second greeter, push it into the stack, and when we get the function, uh, we get the prints. Uh, but this was very explicit. We had a lot of boilerplate code that we want to remove. Basically, we want to go from this code with the detail scope and all the uh, objects being created and pushed to just a plain old function where we're creating two greeters. Uh, what do we do when we want to simplify code? We add another layer of indirection. 
So the first one would be to move the push from you know, our main function into the greeter objects. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Next, we want to add another layer of indirection. Instead of actually naming the stack and passing it around, we want to store it somewhere else where we can use it. Uh, since we are not seeing anything here, the only possible option is global variables. So uh, since functions, as we keep calling them, we keep creating new destructor scopes uh, down the call stack, we'll create a global stack for destructor scopes. And uh, each time we enter a new scope, we'll add it to the global stack. Then when we leave a destructor scope, we'll pop it from that stack. So at each point, we'll know which uh, stack to add to. So our greater changes from pushing to a specific from pushing to a specific uh, destructor stack that was passed along to it, to pushing the, the what? It's very confusing. To pushing to the destructor scope that is the current one in the global stack. And our usage now does not uh, need to name that scope. We just create one and use it in, uh, indirectly. Next, uh, we want to move that destructor scope out of the main function. Because think about it, if we now write one main function, that's OK. But for every function we write, we need to call that it's to create a new destructor scope. We want to make that automatic. So the first step, since the destructor scope has nothing to do with the actual function methods of code, only conceptually, you take the destructor scope and put it around the call to the function. Then in the next step, we create a function that calls uh, our main function with the destructor scope surrounding it. Now, if you see the uh, star args, star star quarks, uh, that's basically how we do a uh, perfect forwarding in Python. Takes whichever parameter we pass and just copies them along. Then, with the call function, uh, we can instead of create an actual uh, function, we can move it into another function as a closure and create a temporary function that wraps main with a destructor scope. Uh, here you can see that the wrapper uh, CPP function is our uh, sorry. CPP function is the one that creates wrapper, takes our main function, creates a wrapper function. The wrapper function is a closure that captures uh, the function we passed in, the main function, and then we return uh, it creates a scope like the call function we had before, and then returns the wrapper. Then we store the wrapper into scoped main, which is just like main but with that scope, and then we call scoped main. But Python is a very dynamic language, so we can also redefine main. We just bind the name main to the new function. And then we can just use main everywhere. But we can still do better. This operation of replacing a function with some, uh, after some processing and assigning it back to the uh, original name is very common in Python and it has a special syntax uh, called de decorator syntax. We just use a function decorator, which is that uh, at function syntax above the function definition. And that's completely identical in the code, just a lot easier to read. So now, whenever we define a function, we just use uh, at the fu uh, CPP function before the function. And we can do that everywhere. It's a lot simpler than what we had before. It's declarative, it's clean, but it's still explicit. We still have to say explicitly, this is a C++ function. It's not a regular Python function. And after all, we're really looking for something to be implicit. Um, any questions so far? OK. Yes. Yes. Uh, OK. Uh, Python has a type that's called exit stack that does what our detail scope does. Uh, since we're going to expand our detail scope uh, class in a moment, I just prefer showing that one instead of uh, moving around. Anything else? OK, moving on. And this is where things get really hairy. We're, start, uh, we're going to start messing with the import system in Python. So let's look at our current code, uh, if it was an entire file. First, from our C++ module, we import C++ function, because we don't want to implement it again and again and again. And then from the greeter module, we import the greeter object, uh, the greeter class, and then we can just then we can just 
Uh, we can just use the function, and we're good to go. Now, wouldn't it be nice if instead of doing OK. OK, the volume is different. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, so wouldn't it be nice if instead of uh, using all the code that we saw before, like we import and then we still need to use the function, uh, we still need to decorate our main function and only then call it, we could just import magic from C++ and have everything happen magically? Well, this is what we're going to do now. But let's start. OK. This work now. Ooh. Feedback. Ooh, feedback, feedback. Doesn't seem like there's feedback. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. So before we can actually get the import to solve everything for us, uh, let's take it step by step. Before we call the uh, main function. Let's take it step by step. Before we call the main function, we're going to call uh, magic directly. Uh, what does magic actually need to do? It has to do two things. One, find out which module called us. Two, decorate all the functions in that module. Uh, to get the calling module, uh, we use the inspect module uh, to traverse the call stack and see which module called us. Uh, Python has that functionality. Let's hope that one day C++ does too. And then we decorate all the functions. Basically, we go in a loop over all the members of the module. We check whether that uh, member is a function using the is routine uh, method. Then we make sure that they were defined in that module because we don't want to decorate something that was imported because we could either decorate it twice, which won't be nice, or decorate a pure Python function that should not be decorated. And then eventually, we use set attribute uh, to set uh, the function again to the decorated version. Uh, now for our next trick, we're gonna make the magic call disappear. Uh, okay, see how we do that? We need to talk about the import mechanism first. Basically when we, uh, Uh, when we import from C++, import magic, and what happens is we go and check in the global uh, module cache whether C++ exists. Uh, if it does, we go directly to name binding. If it does not, we create a new uh, object module, module object, sorry, uh, store it in the global cache, and then execute the module. Uh, once we're done executing the module, we go uh, into the name binding part. We ask, is magic a part of the C++ module? Uh, if it is, we just assign it to that name. If it is not a part, we go and call the get attribute, uh, the get utter function of that module and pass in the, na uh, the name of the uh, object we want, in this case, magic. Uh, which means that if we write our code correctly, we can have a function call every time our code gets imported. Which is what we're going for. Uh, so the change we need to make, we change the name of magic to underscore magic, so it would not be uh, the name that we were actually importing. And then when we try to import magic, we get to get other, we check whether the name is magic, and if it is, we call the magic function. If not, we throw an attribute error to fail the import. Uh, then we try to run the code, and we run into an issue. We see hello one and hello two, but no goodbye. 
it seems like the cycle for uh, creator was not called. Uh, the issue is basically that when we actually run, sorry, uh, when we actually run the function uh, and try to decorate everything, uh, nothing in the module has been defined yet. We're the first line. By the time we run, there's no main function, no other imports, nothing has happened. Uh, so we try and decorate everything that was there, which is nothing, and nothing happens. So one solution would be to move the magic uh, a bit lower in the code. First define all the functions and then make the magic happen. But that does not feel very magical. So we should find a different solution. Luckily, Python allows for parallel imports. Uh, just like we import using uh, the import statement, you can write code to do the import for us. Uh, this is a basic uh, function for importing a module by its uh, path. Uh, it basically does the same thing as we did before. We create a, a module object, we add it to the cache, and we execute the module. Then, in our magic uh, function, we, get, we take the calling module, we import it again, so that we get it after it finished executing, then we decorate all the functions. So things should be okay. So now it should work, and unfortunately we get a recursion error. What happens is uh, our module imported magic, then magic imported our module, then the module imported magic, and so on and so forth until we uh, consume the entire uh, stack. So we need to find a solution for that. Hmm? Yep, basically, yeah. Uh, we're adding a pragma once. Uh, we add a flag to the module. Uh, when we import a new module, uh, we just set a flag in that module. Then, when we uh, call the magic function, we check, is that flag set? If it is set, it means that it's a parallel import that we did, and we don't need to, uh, to import it again. This stops the recursion, and then we get a new error. Uh, basically, main was run, sorry. Uh, what happens is um, we run the function, uh, we run the code, and uh, we import our module, we import it again, and then during the execution of that module, uh, we encounter the call to main. So main runs before the module finishes executing, so before it was decorated, uh, since the greeter already has a reference to the scope, uh, we try to access the disarctal scope, which is empty, and we crash. So we need to make another change. Uh, this is quite nice and makes everything a bit more uh, C++-like already. Instead of calling main explicitly, uh, we add a code, a code to main that checks if the code is the main module. And in Python, if you just execute a file instead of importing it, the module name for that file would be under main, and, sorry, underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore. And if we find that module and we see that we imported it, we can just go and run the main function for that module. And when we're done, uh, we just call sys exit in order to quit the program. And with that, everything works again. Uh, we have magic, and we just write a uh, plain old main function, and it works. We have the destructor happening, and everything is very nice. Uh, any questions? Let's start. What, uh, the question was, what if the user changes the name of main? Uh, basically, like in C++, uh, you need a main function. So I'm good with that. If you don't have a main function, nothing will execute. But basically, it's, we're creating a weird mix of C++ and Python. Uh, so we're defining a few things that are different than regular Python code. Yes. Okay, the, if I understand correctly, the question was, what about adding these and the things inherently to Python, like modifying Python for that? Yeah, so the question was, can we modify the interpreter to do that? Well, on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, what I'm not getting into in this talk is lifetimes. 
Uh, in C++, we have a lot of semantics in the language to help us manage lifetime so that we, when we return a value or pass it into a function or anything of that sort, it would be handled correctly, which is a very big and complicated topic even in C++. Um, without handling that, all of this uh, resource management is fun and useful in some cases, but not in gen general sense. So doing that to Python would be very incomplete and produce an unusable language. Yes, this is. No. Yeah. Okay, this code is in our C module, which holds all our C mechanisms. And when it gets imported by the main module, which is the one that got double clicked or executed via the command line, and the name of that module would be main, and we detect it and run the main function for that module. So any library that gets imported would not be called name, uh, main, sorry. And then we know that we only run execute main from the right module and only once. But still, is it correct to say that the calling module is just if it's main, it's main before it's called main? Okay, so the comment was that uh, we can check for the name main in the calling module. This is partially correct because since we're importing the module twice, it would run twice with the same name. And if we don't exit immediately after executing main, it would still get into the original module. Also, this is a lot more fun because it's like more C++ like. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, this is one example of uh, using the magic So the question was whether we can add strong, strong types to Python. Yeah. So Python is a strongly typed language, is dynamically typed, but is strongly typed. Uh, so yeah, we can reassign types and get different, uh, different types in them. You know, and there are static checkers that can help us, but that's basically beyond the, talk, uh, the scope of this talk. And uh, we can chat about it later. Okay, carrying on. Let's look at the greater uh, object again. Just dealt with main, now we're back to greater. Now, if you look at it, there's a lot of boilerplate here. We need to push this destructor. We have an enter method that does nothing, basically. And the exit method, given that it's a destructor and we never pass arguments to the destructor, it's quite a lot of code that we need to write every time, uh, which repeats itself. And it would be very nice if we do not have to write it for every single object we create. So, we create the base class. If you just push everything out up to the base class, our creator becomes a lot simpler, and you'll notice that I took the opportunity to change the names of the uh, constructor and destructor to be more C++-like. Now, I'm sorry I could not use a tilde because Python does not support it, so you'll have to do it with an underscore for the destructor. Uh, but I still think it's nicer than uh, Dunder exit. About the class itself, uh, nothing too interesting. Basically, it has the init method, the enter method, and the exit method. And the main difference is that here in, in the constructor and the destructor, we check whether a method exists in the uh, subclass uh, that is named the same as the class itself. If it is, if there is one, we call it. If not, we just don't do anything. Uh, next step, uh, since we have methods, uh, we want to decorate them just the way we did with functions before. Uh, so again, in the constructor, uh, we just uh, go over all the, uh, the members of the, uh, of the class. If uh, we ignore any function that begins with double underscore, because those are spatial functions, uh, they are the Pythonic one that we don't want to change, and uh, then we make sure that the uh, value is a function, and if it is, we decorate it and assign it back into the object. And with that, we can actually write grader that looks like that. But if you remember from before, we still have an, uh, have an issue here. This is very explicit. You have to write down CPP class. It does not look like you know, regular code. Why, why do we subclass anything if we don't want any new functionality? So what actually happens when we subclass something to be, um, sorry. Uh, we basically copy the functions from the uh, parent class into the subclass. Well, not exactly copy, but 
that's good enough as an approximation. Uh, if that's all we are doing here, uh, then again, since Python is a dynamic language, we can just take a class object and add functions to it. And then we don't need a subclass. So we just create a C++, uh, CPP class function that takes a class, modifies it a bit, just like the subclass, uh, the parent class did, we just add the new methods and decorate uh, all the me uh, methods that need to be decorated. And then we return the new class object. And uh, additionally, decorators, the syntax works for classes as well as functions. So we just add a new decorator and we're done with that. Uh, one small thing, before we could use uh, the type of the object to actually check whether it's a C++ class that we created or a regular Python object. Now we cannot do that because the type is just a class. And so we add another flag into the object uh, so that you can detect, yes, it's our special kind of class and not a regular one. Uh, additionally, we go to the magic function and make sure to decorate all the classes as well. Uh, it's very simple to, uh, similar to what we did with the functions. We go through the model, we check whether something is a class, we check that it's defined in the current model, and if it is, we decorate it. And with that, Critter looks a lot nicer, a lot more like C++. And it prints whatever we want it to print. Yes. Can you repeat the question? Okay, the question was, uh, can we have classes that outlive the scope of a function? Uh, the answer is, we'll get to that in a moment. What? Can you repeat the question? Okay, so, we, okay, so there's no decorator, but what we did before, uh, just like when we decorated the, all the free functions, uh, we added the decorator to all the classes. We go through the module, find all the classes, and decorate them. Any other questions? Okay. So what we did so far, uh, we made sure that the structures are called automatically, and we made sure that it's implicit. We do not change the interfaces when we add a new member, uh, when we add the structures, everything lo looks just like regular Python code. Uh, additionally, main is called automatically, which is fun. Uh, next up would be composition. So looking back uh, into the archive class, we had 11 lines of code, four of them are resource management. Uh, now we're doing a bit better. We have nine lines of code, and only two of them are resource management, uh, specifically the destructor. And still want to do, we want to do better now. There is also one small hiccup. Uh, the destructor for the member gets called twice. Once, when we leave the constructor, uh, since we leave the scope, the destructor for zip file, which was created in that scope, gets invoked. And then, eventually, when we stop using the class and we uh, call the destructor for our better archive reader, we also call the destructor. Additionally, every usage in the meantime would use a destructed object. Um, let's say it's undefined behavior. Um, so, um, what can we do about it? Um, essentially, we just remove it from the uh, destructor scope before we leave the function. Um, to do that, we go to our destructor scope that we created earlier and add a remove function. Uh, but we have just one issue with adding that function. List.remove is uh, equality-based and not identity-based. So if we have two, uh, two classes that compare equal, uh, we would remove whichever one of them that we get, we get to first, which is not what we want. So uh, we take a trick from the C++ playbook and add a, a customization object. Basically, we create an object, an identity comparator that takes an object and changes its equality check to identity. And then we pass that to remove, 
And as we go around and compare objects, we will hit only the one that is identical. It is the same object, the same memory address uh, as the object you want to remove. And we can go ahead and actually remove it from the scope. Now we're good. And everything works. We, and the object survives the end of the scope. And we only get distracted uh, when we leave the uh, when we close, sorry, when we distract the archive reader. But it's still explicit, and we don't like explicit code. Uh, one thing that's common to do in those cases is write getters and setters. After all, we have a lot of functionality that we need to do whenever we change the member. Uh, the getter in our case is going to be very simple. We just return the value. We're not going to allow moving objects out of the uh, host objects at the moment, or entirely in this talk. Uh, our setter is a bit more complicated. When we set the value, we need to do two things. One, if there was already a value in there, we need to call its destructor because now no longer exists. Then we need to take that object, remove it from the scope it was in, and just store it. And since getters and setters are, again, something that's quite common, uh, Python has syntax for that uh, called descriptors. If we have a member, a class member object, not an instance member, but a class member object that implements get and set methods, it becomes a descriptor and accesses to that object for the class uh, would use those methods. So we have the set method, which sets a value, the get method, which gets a value, and we have an extra one, which is the set name function. That one is called upon class creation, not instance creation, but when the class type is created, uh, to give the object created, the C++ member object, the name of the variab variable it is assigned to. Then in the C++ uh, member class itself, uh, in set name, we take that name and we save it because since it is a class object, uh, we have to save the actual uh, variable somewhere. That place would be in the, per in the hosting class in a variable of a different name. So we take the name of our variable and prefix it with something. Here we're using underscore. And then in the getter, we access that specific uh, new name in the uh, host class, which we get in the instance, instance variable. And in the setter, we do the same uh, again with the instance variable. Now this is implicit. The uh, next step would be removing the destructor. After all, uh, in C++, we don't explicitly call the destructors of, of all our members. We just trust the language to do that for us. And we want to do the same here. So we go back to the exit method that we defined in the C++ class, uh, C++ CVP class function earlier. And we had another check to it. And we basically go over all the members of the object we're destructing. Uh, we check if they begin with underscore. If they do, uh, they're the private name, and we don't want to touch that because we don't want to have duplicates and destruct something twice. Then we make sure that the object we're looking at is a CPP class object, uh, which means it's something that has a destructor that needs to be called. And then we call the destructor. Now that we're traversing them in reverse order, so that they would be destroyed in the right order. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, one final touch. Uh, one thing that's still too explicit here for my taste is the C++ member object. We actually create it explicitly and, and write something that does not look like Python in the code. Uh, but again, Python have the, has a solution for that. Uh, Python has what's called type annotations. You cannot strictly define a variable to have a specific type, but you can assign a type to it. It does absolutely nothing at runtime, but it is stored in specific variables, specifically for a class. Uh, all the member annotations are stored in the annotations uh, member variable. Then we can create a function that creates members for us. Uh, when we create a CPP class, we get in the class, we check the annotations uh, field, and then we take all the names from there, create CPP member objects, and store them in the class. So they would be used as descriptors, and we'd get the getters and the setters. Now, because the class has already been created, and we're modifying it, but not creating a new type, a set name would not be called automatically. And so we need to call it ourselves, but we know the name of the object, so it's not an issue. And then in the destructor, again, since we already know the names, we could save them before. 
we go over the list of names and we don't need to make much checks, just to make sure it's actually a C++ object. And if it is, we call it destructor. And we're basically done. Uh, we have our new best archive reader. It has seven lines of code, unlike 11 that we had before, and none of them are resource management. Everything is functionality. Uh, you may claim that the zip file thing uh, at the top, the annotation, is for resource management, but in that case, I would claim that it's for readability, and it's my talk, so I win. <laughs> um, and basically, we're done. Uh, our code is automatic. It automatically calls the destructors. It's composable. We can add new members without changing our code except for the addition of a member. And it's implicit. Well, assuming you write all your code using this style of code and make the imports in the right places. Uh, we don't need any extra code other than the import. Uh, there are no changes to the interfaces as you ch add constructors. And nothing propagates up, again, except for the need to import uh, magic from C++. Any questions? Yes. All right, so and the question. So the question was, can we mix regular Python code with this code? And the, question, and the answer is yes, but there are some caveats. In C++ style code, we can import Python functions and modules and use them freely, and it just works. In Python code, if we actually want to use a C++ object, uh, we need to use it in a function that's decorated with the CPP function uh, decorator. Otherwise, when we initialize objects, there would be no scope for them to relate to. Uh, we can also do some of that boilerplate manually, but you may run into issues. Again, I do not recommend using that in actual production code. It's a nice trick, but I do not guarantee that it, will, it would work perfectly. Also, there are a lot of things we did not cover here today. Uh, ranging from inheritance to lifetime management um, to a lot more. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Brack Itkin for helping me go over the slides and making sure that it seems consistent, and Adisha Vita and Balevi for uh, encouraging me to submit the talk. And now we have time for some extras. Uh, so, three things. One, uh, return values. Two, this instead of self. And three, member access specifiers. Now, this is going to be a bit of like going through code because it's not in the slides. Uh, let's do it. And can you see the code, or should I uh, make it larger? Is okay? Okay. Uh, so there was a question regarding uh, objects surviving the end of a scope. And yes, it is an issue, but um, we already have all the tools we need to solve that. Uh, in our CPP function uh, wrapper, when we return from a function, initially we just return the code. Uh, we have just a return statement here, and we just return the value. Uh, but uh, instead of doing that, we can say, oh, you return a value from a function, it means it should survive the end of the function. Uh, so we go and we rebind it. Rebinding is very simple. If something is a C++ class, which means, again, it has a destructor and it needs to be associated, uh, we just remove it from the current scope. Uh, you can see the minus one, it's the current one, and then we push it onto the parent scope. And then it extends the lifetime. You can do something similar when you pass arguments into functions, uh, but again, without um, all the many uh, C++ features that make those things work properly, this would be nice and fun, but not actually useful and essentially broken. Now, next, this. Um, there are two things that I think C++ developers really hate about Python. Uh, one of them 
is having to pass self around all the time. I mean, what, what's the point? You have a class, you know what the class is. Why do you need to name it all the time? Say, okay, take self in this uh, function and take self in that function. Uh, well, we have a solution for that. Oh, I'm sorry, you'll have to excuse me. I'm going to try and change microphones again because doing this with one hand is difficult. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so, um, uh, since we're using this, which does only exists for methods and not for functions, we have a different decorator for methods and for functions. Um, and when we call a function, we create a this scope. Uh, essentially, what this scope does is very similar to uh, what we did with the destructor scope. Uh, we have a global stack of this point, and whenever we create a new this scope, we push the uh, new class into that scope. And we leave, we pop it up. Then, when we actually want to use this, uh, we have a proxy. Since uh, variable names in Python are not actual objects like in C++, when you assign to them, you don't have any assignment operator or something like that, you just rebind the name, and we're going to just change this to something else. Instead, and we have a proxy. And the proxy basically says that whenever you access any attribute, uh, just forward it to the top of the stack. And then we get whatever is in the stack, which is the kind of this pointer or self, and we're good to go. So function, like the constructor may look like this. We just get the name, no self here, and this dot name equals name, and in the destructor, we can just use, again, this dot name. Um, no, syntax highlighting is not happy about that. PyCharm is very angry at what I'm doing here, because here we have a function that has no, uh, no self. This is highlighted as if it is the self. It doesn't really know what's going on, but that's OK. Uh, so we have this, and we got rid of self entirely. Next. Uh, this is a bit more complicated. Member access specifiers. Uh, another thing that's very common to Python programmers is we create a class, and then we want to have a private public function, so we just create public function. Then, if we want to create a private one, we just prefix it with, a, with an underscore, and then everyone knows that it's a private function. I mean, there's an underscore that you know to never call it, right? Now, if you're really serious about that, you can add another underscore, <laughs> which is like, really meaningful, because now, in addition to being longer, it also does some name mangling when you call outside the function, so it's harder to call by accident. But programmers do not call private functions by accident. They know what they're doing, just maybe don't know the consequences. Uh, so we want to fix that. We want to make sure that private functions are private and that public functions are public. We don't want to have that mix. So uh, we're going to add a new syntax. We're going to be able to call public or private in our classes. Now, this is going to build on basically everything we've done so far. We're going to have global variables, and we're going to have decorators, and all that sort of fun. So uh, first. We create different uh, access types. We have default, which is whatever you have when you haven't chosen anything yet. We have private, public, and protected. Great. Also, we have two global variables. One to store access info, which we'll see in a moment, and the other to store the current access, uh, which is defaulting to private, because uh, we're in Python. All we have is classes, no structs. Uh, then you have the set access function. It does quite a few things. One, uh, we need to state global current access because we change the access in this function. And if you would not define, say that, hey, are you talking about the global variable? When we write, it, we just 
assume it's a local variable. Now, uh, what we do here, we go and check uh, who's calling us. We check the frame above the caller, which basically means the frame in which public is executed, which is inside the class definition. And we take all the, the local variables from that scope. And then we also take all the, annot uh, we take the annotations from that scope. Uh, so if you look at this function, by the time we run public, and we have an annotation for name, and that's it. If you had another function here, we would also get it. Then we go over all the names of all the local variables and the annotations. And you make sure, again, that it's not with double underscore, because then we ignore them. And then if they are not already in the access info dict, we store the name with the current access. So if we're here, we have name, uh, which is an annotation, and we store it in the global dictionary uh, with, the, uh, with private access. And then, last step, we set the access to public. Uh, so everything following that would have public access. Uh, then we define two functions, and we're done. Next. Okay, I might have a bug here. Um, Next, we go to the CPP class definition. And when we finish defining a class, obviously, we reset the access to whatever it was outside of the class. And in the class, when we, create, when we decorate the methods or create the members, we make sure to tell the, uh, the method uh, the current access level, which it gets from the global variable. Uh, so that happens with the method. And for the uh, variable members, again, uh, we change CPP member to accept the access as well. So it knows what kind of access the variable has. Any questions so far? OK. Then, uh, let's go to method implementation. Uh, the first thing we do in the FRM, uh, method implementation is we check the current access. Uh, basically check uh, our current object and the, the access level which was passed in when we created the method. It was captured uh, in this closure. Check access gets the current caller since we need to see whether the, uh, what called us is relevant. And then it checks if it may access the current access level. So um, if there was no caller, which means we got called from pure Python code, and we just say it's OK because we want to be able to write tests and use it in Python code, then if the access is public, everything is OK. If it's protected, we make sure that we're either the original class type or a subclass of that. And if it's private, we make sure it's the exact same type. Otherwise, no access. Now, and then we raise an access error. As for getting the caller, um, once more, we have a global stack. This time, it's a caller stack. Uh, we have also a caller scope. Whenever, whenever we enter a new function, we create a new caller scope and save the current caller. The caller can be either a function or a class. Currently, we do not support friends, just you know, classes. Uh, members can be private or public, and that's it. Friends can be added, but we don't have time for that at the moment. So here uh, in the CPP method, we add the current object uh, into the color scope. And the CPP function, we add the current function to the color scope. Uh, here, of course, we don't need to do any uh, access checks. And then this code. As I said, I have some bugs in the code, apparently. That can be solved later. Anyhow, now this seems to work. And if we remove the public, we get an access error, 
which is really fun because now you can actually have proper access checks in Python. Uh, and that sums up the content. Any questions? Yes. Uh, can you repeat the question? I did not hear it. Oh, yeah, now you do not need to pass. Oh, okay. Just naming a function and having. To, no, you cannot do that in Python. Uh, the name would not. Okay, the question was can you just call member functions or access member variables without using this period, whatever? Uh, you cannot do that in Python. The name would not be bound. There may be a way to solve that. I don't have a solution to that now. Uh, okay, yeah, there are many ways to make uh, this code do more, which is basically uh, parse Python code, uh, change JST, using um, the forbidden fruit module to hack quite a lot of things in Python. Uh, the idea here was to try and limit ourselves to actually standard Python that is properly documented in the Python documentation and not hack our way around too much. Uh, this theoretically should work on different implementations of Python. I'm saying theoretically because I did not test it on any other implementation, so I cannot guarantee. Yeah. Uh, yes, you can get the color from the tracebook model, but then you have to start fudging around and counting how many, uh, how many steps up the color stack you need to go. And it's a lot easier to just add another scope, save it somewhere else, and access it when you need to. Any other questions? Okay. One last thing. So before I submitted this talk, um, I realized that my COVID hair has gotten long enough that I can make a man bun. And I posted, tweeted about it, and then they was like, okay, there's one thing you need to do. You need to submit a talk. You need to present the talk. And then you need to poll the audience about your man bun and see what they think. So this is what we're going to do now. Is the first documentation of me ever having a man bun. So we'll see how that turns out. So uh, now by raise of hands, who is for man bun? Okay, that's impressive. And who's against? <laughs> I think you kept your hand all the time. <laughs> okay. And that concludes the talk. Thank you. <laughs>